Hi, uh, following on from our last video, which was about uh, QUTS Hero H5.3.0 being available for public beta, um, I'm now going to talk about one of the features that's part of that beta that's, uh, that you must have that beta running to be able to use, which is our High Availability Manager. Um, so anybody with the minimum requirements, two NAS, same spec, um, is able to use this. Um, if you've got the uh, the right versions on, on what's available for the public Vita right now. Um, so here we've got uh, the high availability manager software that I'm going to demo today. So sort of a little animation here that sort of explains what it does. Uh, you've got two separate NAS. Um, they're both identical. Um, one is active, one is passive. Um, there's a heartbeat link between them. Checking um, to make sure that they're both online. Um, should something happen to one of them, if the active one especially goes down, uh, the passive one becomes the active one. Uh, completely automatically, uh, without user intervention. Um, I'm going to be logged into the NAS to show you the process, but if nobody was logged in, the, th the same stuff would happen. I'm not going to actually click anything to, to make it happen. Um, but this is what we're going to be using uh, with this software. So what I've got here, um, the only setup I've done so far is configured two NAS that are the same. In this case, I'm using uh, the TBS-H574TX at the top left corner there. It is running the public beta of QUTS Hero H5.3.0. Now, the only setting that I've changed, apart from installing High Availability Manager, was in the network and virtual switch. So part of the requirements for setting up HA um, is that one of your network adapters um, is set to a static IP address. So here on this NAS, um, this is what I've called the active NAS. Very boringly, we can sort of see that um, here in the general settings. We can see active NAS. So I've called one active NAS, one passive NAS, just doesn't really matter what you call them. It's just so that I can keep track of them. Um, so active, I've set on 20.1 on the last set of the IP addresses. And the passive NAS is set to 20.2. Um, so that's what we're going to use to connect between them. So that's the only setting I've done is set the static IP address on adapter 1. Now, because this NAS only has two adapters, one is 2.5 gig, one is 10 gig. I'm going to use the 10 gig for the heartbeat link um, and the snap sync connection and the, getting the data between them. I want the faster link uh, for replicating the data. So that's the reason I've done it this way around. Um, 2.5 gig for the cluster or for the user access to the NAS, the, the sort of the service port, if you like. Um, and then I've got adapter to the 10 gig link for the dedicated communication between the two NAS. In my case, I have a direct link between them, not through a switch, because um, they're right next to each other. OK, so that's the only setting I've changed. So here I'm going to go into High Availability Manager on the active NAS. So I've got the passive NAS over here. It's the exact same setup. So here if I go into Network and Virtual Switch, we can see interfaces at 10.10.20.2. Um, I've not set a static address on Adapter 2. That gets done as part of the setup. Um, so here I'm going to go on Active NAS. I'm going to open up the High Availability Manager application and it pops up a wizard. Um, so it's just giving you the requirements of what you've got. So I'm going to click Create a Cluster now. So before you begin, here's a checklist to make sure that it's all set up correctly. And this is exactly how mine is set up. So I have the 2.5 gig port going through a 2.5 gig switch, uh, which is connected to the internet where the users are. Uh, and I've also got the heartbeat connection directly between them, no switch. So I'm going to click Next here. Now it's asking for the cluster connection. So I'm going to choose that to be adapter 1, 2.5 gig. Um, and I'm going to choose the heartbeat connection to be the 10 gig. So click Next. <clears throat> so once it uh, goes off, we're going to scan the network. We're going to log into the passive node. Um, it's going to need the administrator account, username and password details of the, uh, the passive device. Um, and then we'll be able to log in. It'll check that the hardware is the same. It'll give you a little summary to show you what that looks like. OK, so now it wants an administrator account of the passive NAS. So that's just Craig. I'll type the password in. Click Next. Uh, so now it's going to log into the NAS and come back and check if everything's set up ready to create a cluster. So we can see that that's done. Um, lots of green ticks there. Everything's good. Um, storage is consistent between them. The same amount of drives in each same spec on both NAS. So everything's uh, really good there for the connection. Uh, so now we're going to click Next. Now it wants a cluster host name. Now this is the host name that you'll be logging into the cluster with. So although we've got NAS1 called Active NAS and uh, NAS2 called Passive NAS, 
those names are effectively going to go away. That's just for your reference for managing the cluster now. Um, the cluster host name is what the users will access. So you can call this whatever you want. We can use the example there of cluster 01. So I'll just do that. It's just nice and simple. Um, and it wants the cluster IP sort of allowed IP range. So there's a thing that this is the IP address for accessing the cluster. So whilst this one is 10.10.21 and this is 10.10.22, um, we're going to pick a new IP for the cluster that people are going to access. So it'll have a new name and a new IP. And this is the IP that gets moved between the two NAS. Should, say, the active NAS fail, um, the passive NAS will become um, the cluster IP. So I'll set that as 10, 10 10.20.5. Nice. Put number five there. So that's what the cluster information is going to be to access the data. Um, the cluster will automatically decide which NAS the users are accessing based on which is active and which is passive. So I'm going to click next. <clears throat> so it's just checking that's possible. Those IPs and host names aren't already used on the network. So it's going to go off and set that up. So confirm the settings and it's going to let me create the cluster. So while it's creating, this takes a few minutes. So I'll probably just stay quiet while this runs, put it on fast forward so that you can see it. Um, but I'll click create now and it'll set the cluster up for me on both NAS. Um, it may warn me, but effectively passive NAS is going to be completely erased as part of this process. So if there was any data on the passive NAS, the one you're setting up as the passive NAS, it will be completely erased um, when this uh, cluster is created. So you do have to check. Here's the warning. So just letting you know. Um, all services will be stopped while it's being created and all data on the passive nodes will be gone. So you have to understand that and agree to that. Um, there's no coming back from this. It's permanently deleted and non-recoverable. So I'll just click OK and we'll just watch the progress meter here as it's going through setting itself up. OK, so that uh, took just less than five minutes. Um, so what we're going to do now, we're going to have a look through all of the uh, sort of options and settings available within the High Availability Manager application. Um, those eagle-eyed among you will realize that the tabs at the top that used to say Active NAS and Passive NAS, they've now changed to Cluster 01 and Cluster 01-2. So it's effectively renamed the NAS. Um, if you're also using this, um, uh, if, you, if you've got QFinder Pro installed, QFinder Pro will also show um, the changes that have taken place here. So here I've got a few different devices on. Uh, we can see at the bottom here that cluster 01 passive and one is active. We can see that one is a, um, a node, one is the cluster itself. So you can see the different uh, options between them. So uh, 10, 10, 20.2 um, and its other IP address. So you can see all the information. Um, cluster 01 is active. So we've got a few more IPs on this one. We've got the node itself. Um, we've got the heartbeat one. It's in red because I can't access that. It's a dedicated link between them. And you've got the cluster IP. So it's letting you know that the high availability is set on it here. So you can still see the information here um, in uh, QFinder Pro as well. Um, so here we can sort of see the information. We can expand out, expand out some information about the storage pools, which way the data is sinking. Um, so everything's looking good there. You've got a few options here with manage. You can update the firmware of the cluster, update just the high availability manager. You can do a manual switch over from active to passive. You can switch those around um, at a time that suits you. Um, you can remove the passive node or remove the cluster altogether. So you've got different options here. Um, within the uh, sort of cluster overview page. If I go down to nodes, it gives me a bit of information about the two nodes, so I can see all the specs. And here I can do things individually for the nodes. So if I wanted to, I can go here and I can restart and shut down each node individually rather than as a cluster if I wanted to as well. Uh, come down to settings. Um, it's letting you know the information about the uh, high availability network, so green status lights, the IPs of everything, heartbeat interface. Uh, failover policy as well. So this is something I would recommend enabling. You can enable a quorum server. Um, so it's going to 
prevent any sort of split brain problems so that if there is a fail um, in the high availability cluster and we do have a switch over and then both come back online, you may have a situation where both are trying to be active and the quorum server can assist that. So I'll just use uh, the DNS address of the uh, one on my network here so I can do a quick ping test just to verify that's there, ping OK. So I'll just tick that and use that as my quorum server. So I'll apply that one. Over here in other, just the language the logs are going to appear in. And down in event logs, everything about what's been happening since I set it up. We've only just set it up, so it's pretty clean right now. Now here in the cluster page, we can see everything that's happening um, between the two. Um, I can come over here and log into the other one if I want to. Um, this is uh, just going to show that it's basically in maintenance mode. There's nothing you can really do or change here. Um, it's part of the cluster. It's been managed by the other one. So we can see maintenance mode. Um, Bit of log information, notification settings, but the high availability manager basically looks the exact same. It's just this is now being viewed on the second node in the in the cluster. Um, so I'll close that down. But right now I'm accessing it through the cluster IP that I set. So I'm not accessing it via the 20.1 address for the active NAS or the 20.2. I'm accessing it via 20.5. Um, so now what I can do is I can either do a manual switch over or something that's maybe a bit more fun. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pull the two Ethernet cables out of the active NAS, the one we're currently looking at, and we'll see um, in real time it's switching over. So that's both network cables removed and we can start seeing immediately that there's a few transfer speeds and things that we're updating constantly. Uh, they've all stopped because technically 10.10.20.5, the address I'm accessing this through, which was on active NAS, is now not contactable. Um, so we're just going to wait for it to fail over to the passive node. Um, and once it's on the passive node, everything should refresh um, to let us know everything's good over on the passive NAS. Um, but no interaction here. I'm not changing any settings. All I did was pull um, the two LAN cables uh, out of what is the active NAS version here. OK, so we've just refreshed the page and now we are over um, on the active node, which is now on the 10.10.20.2 or passive NAS that I call it. Uh, we can see in the address bar I'm still accessing the same IP, so 10.10.20.5. Um, but now the active NAS is offline. It's unable to detect, detect the passive node. Um, so everything is now currently um, on the passive NAS. So it all failed over. Everything was fine. Um, cluster-01 is now over on passive NAS. So that if anybody was accessing it, any users, um, they've had to change no settings. Um, the IP of the cluster and the name of the cluster is now physically been moved across to the other NAS. Um, so now uh, what I'll do is I'll plug the two cables back in. Okay, so that's both cables plugged back in. Um, and now we'll just wait for you to see what happens when it um, detects that everything's back um, and on the network. So we can see some signs of life. We've got some transfer speeds. So we're seeing, uh, seeing uh, the units across the heartbeat. Um, just needs to do a bit of checking between itself. So we see that it says there's a snap sync issue in the cluster. They're not up to date. So we're trying to re, uh, regain everything back to a healthy status. No user interaction required for this stage. It's going to do it all on its own. OK, it looks like it's uh, rectified its error that it had. Uh, it's inconsistency. So now it's just processing, setting up the storage space. And uh, we'll wait for it to come back. OK, so now we can see it's automatically failed back over to the other active NAS. So we're, back, we're now back to the active NAS being the active node. Um, so this is still the beta. There are still going to be some changes made. Uh, so, for example, right now when the active node uh, does come back online, it auto fails back. Um, I believe there's going to be a change made where you get to choose if that happens. So maybe you want to wait um, and choose to uh, fail it back to the active node at a time that suits you rather than automatically when the issue is resolved. Um, so that'll be a setting that's coming uh, as we start going through the beta process and bringing out new versions. Um, but yeah, that's the high availability manager uh, moving um, um, the active NAS around to whichever one's still um, available. So should there be an issue? Um, but yes, you can control them um, here with different options. Um, so if you are using this, there will be some um, updates coming soon. So that, you know, as we do developments and uh, fix bugs or 
add new features, you'll be able to use those as well. Uh, but the quorum server there prevented us getting any split brain issues, so it's it's a good idea to enable that. It's not part of the setup wizard, but I personally believe it's quite essential. Make sure you enable the, the quorum server um, so that you've got that uh, there to, to stop any issues with any uh, data corruption between having split brains where there's data on both different NAS. Um, but yeah, really good application, works really well. Um, I've got a lot of warnings up here because we did unplug things. So as, as you'd expect, there's a lot of warnings popped up saying that adapters were disconnecting and things because that's exactly what I did. Um, but yeah, that's uh, automatic failover between the two. Um, everything's online with the nodes, everything's come back. Um, but yeah, no, no user interaction required. Uh, the only thing I did was pull two cables out and plug them back in. Uh, refresh a web page every now and then um, just so that we can get the up-to-date information. Um, if anybody has any questions on this, uh, please do let me know in the comments section down below. Um, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, but that was our high availability manager, still in beta. Um, again, you must have two NAS that are exactly the same and they must be two NAS that are on the beta list to work with uh, QUTS Hero H5.3.0. Okay, again, any questions, let me know. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye.